Okay, we're back with three different stock reviews. This time we have Jaden Sterling on the call. Um, Jaden has previously been on the Payback Time podcast, um, so you can go back in time and listen to one of those episodes. Now with this episode, uh, this is very similar to what we've done with Ryan Sterling, and just a heads up, Jaden and Ryan are not related, although they have the same last name. But in this episode, we're gonna be talking about Apple, which everybody's very familiar with, and then Shoals Technology, as well as Lee Auto. So Scholes and Lee are two different stocks. I actually haven't had any time to prep <laughs> before this call to look into these stocks. But what we're going to do is I'm going to be leveraging Ticker and Jaden will leverage his own platform and we'll kind of compare how, how they both sync up. But why don't we go ahead, let's kick things off with Apple and Jaden. I'll let you take it from here. Hey, Sean, thanks again for having me on your show. Um, yeah, let's let's take a look at what our system is saying. So we have the Sterling stock picker. And right now we're looking at Apple, really nice ascending chart here. Looks like it might have had a thread. Yeah, right there. See where this, the blue box, the stock price mm -hmm. rises above the green and then ultimately above the red. I, I call that threading. And it's where a stock is moving through its short-term averages. That's a really good indicator that something good is going to happen. Sean, you've probably heard the term golden cross. That's, mm -hmm. that's you know, very similar to what happens with the longer-term averages. So we've got the stock price well above the SMA, the EMA, short-term and long-term, which is beautiful, gives it nice support. We've got the money flow index MFI at 53.9, absolute sweet spot. This stock is a buy here, no question about it. Sean, what, what is your what does ticker say about Apple? Uh, before we jump to ticker, just for the audience's sake, it'd be nice to get a little context on your platform um, in comparison to ticker. So ticker uses only the fundamentals. We don't use any technical analysis. We focus on that income statement, cash flow statement, and balance sheet over five years. If we don't have five years of data, you think of like a, like a new IPO stock, then we look at the quarters. But in your case, why don't you give us a little context on what you're looking at in your tool? It's more technical. Is that correct? Yeah, happy to. Thank you. So we have, um, this is our patent pending North Star guidance uh, card. We call it a card because it gives a nice summary of our scoring for stocks. So five stars is our coveted buy now rating. Basically any stock in our system that has five stars you can feel fairly confident you're going to do uh, really well with it. And uh, this this stock here is four stars. So what we ask is if you own it, let's say you don't own it, mm -hmm. then we give a recommendation for the stock. So we're saying buy it between this range, 172.48 to 176.03. Stock is trading at 177.80 currently. So we're basically looking for, there might be a slight pullback. If there is, that would be a really good entry uh, time for the stock. And we actually review the fundamentals, the financials, and the technical indicators when we uh, give a ranking to a company. So fundamentally, we're going to look at insider activity. We've noticed insiders are almost perfect buyers for their stock. They know the timing. And of course, it makes sense because they're on the inside. Then we look at, but not we don't put a lot of weight on future performance. This is basically what all the analysts are saying about the stock. But we also look at the short shares outstanding because, as you know, if there's a large percentage of holders that are short rather than long, it can put pressure on the stock in the short run. So we take those into consideration. We give uh, all three metrics a final score of four stars in the fundamental category. We look at the financials, uh, two stars in terms of our uh, assessment. Revenue growth, very low with Apple. We know that, but they continue to iterate, come out with good products. Um, but overall, their quarterly growth is not that high. In fact, it's minus 3%. Secondly, we're looking at the book value. We like to compare the price of the stock to the book value or the breakup value of the company. So if the company was, you know, let's say to get put on the auction block and everything was sold, all the assets of the firm, 
they would bring in $3.95 per share, whereas the stock price is at $177.80. I mean, you're an investor, Sean, you know that mm-hmm. um, this there's not always a parity with this metric, but we still like to take it into consideration. And then thirdly, um, and of course, we look at the P.E. ratio of the stock versus the industry average, as well as the current ratio. You know, how well is the company executing with the cash on their balance sheet? Uh, one, why? Because everyone knows Apple loves to hoard cash. They keep it on their balance sheet. They don't deploy it um, very often. So very low score there. And then the technicals, our platform is actually overweighted from the technical aspect because we recognize that typically where stocks have come from uh, is where they're going in terms of uh, market price movement. So we we look at the price of the stock versus the short-term EMA and SMA, which we've done looking at the chart. We look at the money flow index. You know, We look at is the stock overbought or oversold? At a three, at a 53.91, right in the sweet spot. So a lot of room to grow there. And then we compare the price of the stock to the short-term averages. So uh, five-star, again, our highest ranking. And then we compare it to the long-term averages, five-star. So on a technical basis, the stock looks like it's ready to pop. All right. And I'll I'll turn it, talking stick over to you to yeah, share your screen. Absolutely. Okay, so jumping over to the ticker rating, everything really focuses on this first screen, but there's a lot of other metrics within. And just a pause here before we really uh, dive in further is some of you may be listening or watching, depending if you're listening to this on a podcast or watching on YouTube, you know, you may be wondering, why are why are we looking at two different screeners? Well, the reason is a lot of people who join ticker, they're actually... We use the phrase, uh, they're triangulating, which means they're using two to three different platforms to look at, not saying you should do this, but a lot of investors do just for confidence, is they'll look at three different platforms just to see if they all say green or all say red before they make a buy or sell decision. Doesn't mean you have to do that, but if you want a little boost there. So, uh, so far with Apple on Jaden's screener, you could see that was a buy. So looking at Apple, we have our, our system, which is our summary is really simple. It's either on sale, watch or overpriced. On sale is green, which is good. That means you can buy it. And red would be overpriced, which is, you know, that's that's definitely a sell time. If, if you have no longer have conviction in the stock, you could say. So in order to get to on sale, you need a score of 50 or higher out of 100. Max score is 100. And we'll dive into how that's achieved here in a second. And then the highest margin of safety you can get is actually 90%. Right now, this is at 75%. So a lot of upside. You can see the share price we have in the tool. We we updated the share price. We usually update once a day, every morning. And that was at uh, $175. You can see fair value. This is in 10 years. And we use the EPS growth rate to calculate this. This is the share price in 10 years, 398 and there's people out there that uh, may be wondering, well, could Apple hit $398 in 10 years? Well, the answer to that, I think you can we can both agree, most definitely yes. And in my opinion, it'll probably hit that in less than three years. But, but um, anyway, everything looks really good here. And I just want to drill into a few other points within. So you mentioned the financials on the quarterly side. You're right. It is a little flat, as you can see here. But on the yearly, we are seeing that nice. It's really the last three years that nice, uh, I would say it like that PowerPoint presentation feel you want with projections. You want to see it moving up and to the right. So that's looking great. Let's just jump down to net income and EPS. Very similar numbers. Both are looking really good there. Um, so 2020 is 3.31, then up to 5.67, then up to 6.15. So that's looking, looking outstanding. That's a BP as a key driver for that margin of safety. If anybody wants to see the calculations on Ticker, of course, you can go to ticker.com. There's a little education tab and you can go right to our calculator. We keep it open source. You could see how, how we arrive at the numbers we arrive at. Um, and then another thing I want to call out here real quick, 
is the earnings calendar. We like to see a lot of green here as well. We can see it was uh, February. There's a slight miss, um, but we did see, uh, you know, beating the expectations and the latest that would be uh, May 3rd. So that's, that's a really good sign when you see a stock consistently beating the analysts expectations. So yeah, overall looking really good. Of course, with stocks on ticker we like to use the forum analysis there's a little tool and we're going to be using chat gpt to automate a lot of that for our customers we cannot wait for that moment the one one challenge just to give you context with the the forums you get the margin of safety part that's the math part but then you have the meaning moat and management the meaning is the the business model how many revenue streams does it have how scalable are those revenue streams will they be around in the next 10 years then you have the moat which is how does the stock compare to the competitors and then you have the management which is really the track record of that ceo and doing that manual, you can do it, but people get a little hung up on that, the competition, like who are the top competitors, um, depending on what you're looking at, it can take some digging. And then the management, getting to know who the CEO is, what they've done in the past, that, I mean, you could be into a 4M, it could, you know, 20 to 30 minutes, sometimes two hours, and it's like, well, I still can't complete this darn thing. <laughs> so... Fortunately, ChatGPT, we're working on this right now as we speak. That tool is going to be able to do a lot of this for our customers. But anyway, I always like to talk about the business model. So, you know, Apple, the majority of the revenues from iPhone, then tablets. They also have subscription services built in. You think Apple TV and other products within. Um, also the computers, a lot of hardware products, but some software. But we like at Ticker, we like to look at businesses that have multiple streams, healthy streams of revenue. You got a meaning there. You can check that box. Then you go to the moat. Sure, you've got a few competitors. You look at um, maybe IBM, maybe Microsoft, maybe um, Dell. I don't know about you guys out there. I just switched to all Apple products in the last year as a late bloomer, you could say. <laughs> Finally arrived. And I can say very impressed with the iPhone and the MacBook Pro. I've, I've got a, one of those uh, newer ones, not with the M2 chip, but the M1. It is just, the performance just blows my mind, especially when rendering video. It's like it, going from, uh, you could say like a, you know, 1997 Camry, which is still a solid, reliable car to like a Tesla Plaid. Like the speed is just yeah. night and day <laughs> difference. I, I so, like, um, I think I saw on your site this stat where it took Apple 38 years to get to a trillion dollar market cap and then two years to get to a two trillion. And now it's sitting at 2.7 trillion. Yep. I mean, it's just f phenomenal the growth that they enjoy. And as a shareholder, we've, as a family, we've owned the stock for 10 years now. It's yeah. just done really well. Yeah. I want to talk about that with your platform in a second, but. Um, let's keep going through the forums. We'll keep it really high level. So the moat, we do check that box and then management. Um, mm -hmm. I, I strongly believe, you know, Tim Cook has done a great job taking the baton, you know, the handoff there from Steve Jobs to him. And, and I read an article a few years back. I don't know if it was from Forbes or CNBC, but a comment was made by an analyst. And I always, you know, the listeners out there, if you ever see articles out there, reviews from an analyst, take them with a grain of salt because sometimes these people don't have any business experience or any investing experience. Maybe they're three weeks into a new job and this is their first review. So you you really don't know. But I read this one article. It was it was written by somebody I think who has got a lot more experience because it pretty much said one of Steve Jobs' biggest accomplishments was actually training and mentoring Tim Cook through the years because he has really taken over the company and done a great job putting the right people into place, especially um, I'm, I'm a proud watcher of Apple TV. I have to say that platform is almost batting a thousand with every show that comes out. I mean, everybody loves Ted, Ted Lasso. Classic. Um, I finished a, a one-off series, Blackbird. Also, Severance with Adam Scott, highly recommend. Um, Tetris movie uh, that 
pure entertainment and you got a little context in the video game itself. I mean, the list goes on. It's like stuff like that. That's not a big revenue generator, but it's like you're you're rounding out the business model and whoever's leading that division from a production standpoint, the production quality of all their shows from uh, screenwriting to directing to lighting to sound design to score, everything is, it's incredible. So um, in, in summary, four M's, you can check every box. This is a buy. Now, going back to yours, because you use technicals, do you run into circumstances when it's telling you to sell, but you still hold the stock because you have strong conviction for the long term? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, we Part of our so- software is called Portfolio Assistant, and it helps someone build a portfolio of individual stocks. And whenever a stock like Apple, for example, pops up in the base of the portfolio, and if the technical indicators show that it might dip in the short run, then what we say is you buy more. So anything in the base, right? You just add to it, uh, continue to buy it. And then over time, like, well, you know, we talked about like buying travelers stock uh, yep. over those years and how it pays off. So whenever it depends on where the stock is situated in a portfolio, whether it's in the accelerate category growth or base anything in the base sean where we 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 cheer and applaud when the stock's on sale we buy more for sure yeah. we're we're big on that too and we got to give uh, the credit to phil town and his teachings we call it mm-hmm. stockpiling so essentially what that means is you have an on sale stock and it drops but still remains on sale that's a stockpiling opportunity. That's when you want to strike while the iron's hot and buy more. And the best two moments in time that that happened was the COVID dip, I call it a 2020. It was really February, March. Market went down 30%. That was amazing because it was a strike down strike. <laughs> Within three months, we we're back at all-time highs. And then really, we're in a really good spot, I would say comparatively in the last month or two. But prior to that, it was really about, what do you think, maybe 15, 16 months when the market was really stuck in this bear market slash recession and stocks are just beaten down severely, especially tech stocks. And that was a great stockpiling opportunity as well. Absolutely. It literally, it felt like it moved sideways for the longest time, kind of hovered at that 150 mark. Um, but it's nice to see all these technology stocks breaking out a little bit here. Mm-hmm. And, you know, typically technology stocks lead markets, uh, lead markets. So as long as we've got that sector performing well, I think we're going to continue with this. It feels like a bull market to me. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I, I've heard other people who are quite experienced in this space say the same thing, like we're out of this. Now the rally's really beginning. The question is, what are we going to do about the debt? Um, th- my feelings, they're probably just going to lift the ceiling. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, same. I think they announced that, in fact, that there was no definitive number that they would lift it to. But, mm-hmm. you know, politics and often returns, portfolio returns are uh, vastly divergent. And yeah. it just seems like, you know, you can get an economy that's not performing well, but for some reason the stock market does. It makes little or no sense, but that's generally how it is, right? It's just an odd thing. Um, but hey, let's just hope it keeps going. Right. Exactly. Now, before we jump to Shoals, um, real quick shout out and props to Jaden and to the listeners out there. Uh, if you ever heard me tell the case study about the guy who, you know, uh, turned a dollar into a million dollars. I know the starting point is probably not a dollar, but um, essentially focusing on one stock that's Traveler's Insurance, Jaden is the guy. So I have numerous case studies of people buying one stock consistently over and over and over because it's a great business model and because it's got great financials. Well, this is a great case study. Jaden, give us 30 to 60 seconds. Talk about your experience there buying Traveler's and that was over a decade. Is that correct? Correct. Happy to. Uh, actually, six years. I was working at Merrill Lynch in 1994. Got the call from Smith Barney. Hey, come over and work for us. I said, great. Let me let me have at it. Went over there. They wanted to give me cash up front. I said, I don't need the money. Give me stock. So they did. I uh, got about 77000 in traveler stock up front. Uh, joined their stock purchase program. Every month, I kept 
like Phil says, stockpiling um, just worked out great. Stock tripled in those seven years from from 94 to 2001, and it went to a million dollars. So that was pretty awesome. Yeah. And and there's a few other people I've talked to through the years that have bought one stock. They have high conviction on it. And then it's not a speculative investment. You kind of look at, I tell people, you know, what Jaden did is very similar to what Warren Buffett did with Geico. And you look at insurance as it's a business model that here in the United States, homeowners in rent and um, and auto insurance are mandatory. I believe it's mandatory in all 50 states for home. And I think it's either 48 or 49 states for auto last time I checked. So Mm. you have a mandated product you have to buy and it's a reoccurring revenue product that people are usually paying their premiums every month, every six months Mm. or every year. And that is the type of business model you want. And you just happen to say, hey, great financials, great business. I'm going all in for six years and here we go. We got a million million bucks sitting. Yeah. yeah, it was an awesome experience. It it showed me and it reinforced what my very wealthy clients did when they came into the brokerage firm. You know, they had a handful of stocks, some four, some six stocks, and this is back in the 90s, that performed really well. They had some had millions of dollars in each and every company. You know, it was like the John Deere, IBM, uh, just the huge behemoth stock uh, companies back then. And it just taught me, okay, diversification's out the window. It doesn't work. It never has. It never will. Um, Rather, a focused, concentrated portfolio is the key to financial independence. Absolutely. Love it. Absolutely love it. All right, let's get to stock number two. This is Shoals Technology Group. I have not done any homework on this business prior to our call. I'd like you to go ahead first. Tell us a little bit about the company and how your screener rates this stock. Sure, let me share my screen. All right, Shoals Shoals Technologies Group, they're in the solar um, energy space, vehicle charging, you know, that's super hot right now. It'll continue to be, it's a business that we think is going to, or an industry that's going to continue to only grow. They're based out of Portland, US company. And so we start from the top. Let's take a quick look at the chart. Okay, so this stock actually, if we look at a year ago, is at fourteen ninety four. Today it's at twenty three fifty one. Kind of some real choppy movements along the way. It is high risk, by the way, so only for folks who are uh, suited for high risk companies. Um, but it had it struggled a little bit. You know, anytime a stock is below the two hundred moving day average, it it really has a tough time getting through that. So it had resistance here at 24 um, and still is right below that 200 moving day average. So I think at at this price, 23.51, I think you can get it cheaper, but we need to see a definitive breakout above that SMA 200 in order for the stock to go higher. So then it has the support rather than resistance. And if you look at the chart, um, let me just go back to here where it broke out at, call it 19, uh, right there. Had that nice jump from 19 to 22, held above the 200 moving day average, went up nicely, little some sideways movement, but that's never a problem with stocks, gives you an opportunity to buy more. We had an actual buy rating here on at May 9th at 24.10 or 24.11 and threaded up. So technically it could look better, uh, but this may be a company that would be in your accelerate part of the portfolio. You wouldn't buy, you know, a lot of it. You would certainly wouldn't bet the farm, but having some type of representation in this space is important as an investor today. MFI is at 76. So we're getting to the point where it be, it's becoming overbought. And when it reaches that 80, I like to look around the 80 mark, then the next move is typically down. So uh, this would be a stock to put on your watch list. Uh, watch it closely. It's got some opportunity um, coming up here. Yeah, there you go. We recommend buy between 2281 and 2328. 
I would say closer to the 2281 mark. Um, 22 to 23 would probably be a good time to pick up some shares. Uh, insiders are split. So buy versus sell. I like to see what we saw with Apple. A lot more insiders loading up with the stock, quite frankly. And then I think you've got this challenge here, which is a 7.39% short shares outstanding. That's kind of high. But it can typically in the short run put pressure on a stock. But as you know, as a short seller, you have to buy those shares back eventually. So those invest those short investors at some point become long investors or at least purchasers of the stock. So there's some buildup there that there may be some money, more money flowing into it. Uh, revenue growth is actually decent uh, for the quarterly up 55%. That's good. That's a good thing. Yeah, decent revenue growth. Interesting, very low PE compared to the space. So the industry average PE is 301. This stock sitting at a 2528 PE. That's really compelling. Um, as you look across the space, you know, PE ratios only help us decide uh, which company is the best better value within a particular sector or industry. So that comparison is actually would put someone. Uh, quite feeling comfortable knowing that they're making, uh, putting their money to good use here. Current ratio is 283, means they're executing on their balance sheet with the purchases that they're making, doing really well that way. Uh, technicals we talked about. Um, yeah, it, an interesting company. I think, uh, what was the market cap? Let me just go back there for this yeah, one. I was looking as well. I see. Um, okay, so 3.9 billion. Yeah. Yeah. Not, not, not a huge company here. Um, so you could potentially see uh, a nice breakout here. I'm betting this next earnings, Sean, this August 14th date is going to be interesting for them in terms of the stock price. Mm -hmm. Well, let's let's go ahead and dive in on the, the ticker yeah. side. Uh, another on sale stock. So scores 56 out of 100. Margin of safety 90%. So share price at about 23 and fair value at 131. Um, so a lot of upside potential here. We'll get into why that is in a second. I'm a little concerned here with the, the five year chart. I don't place a whole lot of weight on this, um, but I'm seeing five years. But when you look at this line here, this is the first time in five years it's hit on sale status that we should start to see this stock increase based on that. Now, let's take a closer look at, um, we'll jump to the financials. Let's take a quick look. This is beautiful. You've got your year over year revenue increasing from left to right. That's exactly what we want to see. But this is what's really impressive. As you were sharing your screen, I had to take a quick peek and I was like, mm -hmm. okay. So we went from a net income of 2.35 million up to 127 million. Incredible jump in profitability. Um, EPS, we went from, I'm looking here at 0 0.02 up to mm -hmm. over a dollar. Um, that's really impressive as well. So profitability is going through the roof. Um, I just want to take a quick peek at cash flow. Nothing too impressive there, but I'm guessing because the score is high, the balance sheet, yeah, yep, has to look pretty good. So assets increasing, that's looking good. Um, liabilities and debts, we want to see decrease. So liabilities are falling off a little bit. Um, maybe that's a reduction in payroll or maybe they are they have a few liabilities like i always think of like manufacturing equipment or real estate if they're kind of offloading but i'd have to dig into that but either way we are seeing a decline which is good um how about debts debts also decreasing as well paying those banks back <laughs> that's a good sign <laughs> um and then equity that's probably increasing yep i'm looking good um, earnings calendar. This is looking outstanding. So look at the, we saw Apple beat expectations by about 8% or six or something like that. Look at this going back three quarters. So they beat expectations by 25%, then by 66%, then 40%. So we are shocking the analysts every time right in a row 
this is this is a good sign as well. Um, we added a new tab here called analyst ratings. Again, each analyst you kind of take their comments and their ratings with a grain of salt. But if you get a lot of green, that usually gives you confidence that, hey, things are happening here. So you can see a lot of these analysts are saying there's a definite price increase, which is great. I only see two red out of the, I've got nine on this screen here. So that's that's looking pretty good. I like the the quick synopsis of the business model. You know, it looks like solar. I did jump over to their website. Right away, I like to go to a website, look at like services or products and just see what's within. You can see solar, energy storage, e-mobility. I want to see what this energy storage. Okay, I see what they're doing. It's it's storage right on the, in this case, they're showing a picture of a wind farm. That makes sense. Okay. Cool. Um, now I will say this, I don't know much about the, other than the meaning of the business. Yes, we can, we can definitely agree that, you know, solar and wind, that is the future. That's not going away anytime soon here where I live in the, in Wisconsin, even the West side of the state, there's more and more, um, solar farms popping up. Mm -hmm. So that's the, there's some people that argue about it. Well, it's taken away from farmland, which reduces our food supply. But um, there are certain areas where it's very hilly. Like you, you think about like a 40, 45, 50 degree angle. That's hard to plow on. Um, so what do you do? Well, if it's facing the right direction, you can put solar in, in mm -hmm. some of these areas. So there's ways that you can create a win-win situation. You still have your farmland, but you still have your the space for, for solar. Um, as far as the issue I have with this, and I'd have to do more homework, and I shouldn't say issue, but it's the unknown, which is the competition in this space. And fortunately, the 4M coming soon, powered by ChatGPT, will help us out with that. And then the the management, uh, ChatGPT, will also help us out with that too. As I don't know who the CEO is, looks like this company went public in 2021. Um, do you have any ideas on when this company was founded? Yeah, let's see. Show, uh, 1996. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, 835 employees, Portland, Tennessee. I didn't know there was a Portland in Tennessee, but I, now I do. <laughs> yeah, when you said Portland, I saw the TN and I'm like, ah, oh, I didn't realize there was a Portland, Tennessee. Yes, indeed. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, really good point to compare it. Um, what I like about them is they're in, like they do the components uh, wire, and then the monitoring, right? Wireless mm -hmm. monitoring system, junction boxes, transition uh, enclosures, uh, wire management solutions. So it looks like they have a comprehensive model in that space where they're providing uh, components, solutions, EV charging applications in the U.S. That's going to pick up quite nicely. Yep. So yeah, I, I like I like to see any business that has multiple verticals that what I call stack that are all related to the primary business model, yep. and these yep. these are stacking up nicely. So yeah, but um, and I'm with you. I think the the head of any company uh, important to know who that person is. You know who they are. Uh, holders, as I look under the holders tab, it's um, huge institutional ownership, 93, over 93%, which is tricky. Of course, BlackRock and Vanguard, they own everything, right? They're the, they're 20% combined, 20% stakeholders in this company. That to me is a red flag only because that means they can yank the price of the stock around. Like if they decide, hey, we're liquidating our position, then, and we don't know how many funds that they're in, but that's a big impact on the price of a stock. So I actually like institutional ownership under 50%, if you can find it. Mm -hmm. um, here, it's uh, a very small percentage insiders, 3.39 in the majority uh, institutions. So yeah, that might, um, it, it might be, at that 23 mark, $22.5, a good short-term play to make some money. And then, um, but a high risk stock is that's its function for us anyway, is to make money. Sure. And then you take the profit and put it in your back in your base stocks. Sure. Yep. 
Yeah, that might be a play. I also like your your comment. We're all about um, buying, holding, and buying more. And mm-hmm. this okay. might be a stock. Don't allocate too much of your your portfolio percentage to this stock. Mm-hmm. But knowing that, I really like the charging station play because based on the homework I've done, U.S., I think we're at about 3% of vehicles on the roads are EV, which tells us, you know, and I think it's by 2035 or 2040 should be about 50%. That tells us significant demand for charging stations all over the U.S. Well, companies like Shoals could be a key player in that mm-hmm. um, for the long term. So, yeah, I, I like it. Going back to Ticker, though, really, really solid financials. We love to see that. What I also like is there are people out there that uh, have come to me and they'll bring me like a stock name that was um, they just were founded two years ago and then they go public two years later. And Mm -hmm. I always say just because you can doesn't mean you should. Mm -hmm. And this goes back to Palantir, which went public in 2020, but they're founded in 2003. So I like mm-hmm. to see companies go a long time, like a decade or longer, generating revenue, stabilizing right. the business, making sure quarter over quarter, year over year, they're increasing, and then make the decision to go public because that shows responsibility to shareholders like you and I. Because, yeah. right, we've all seen those new hot IPO stocks and they go public, the stock rallies. Oh. Yep. And then the first quarter comes out and it's complete garbage. And the stock falls off a cliff. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, like Palantir. Well, even though Palantir is founded back, like it had a huge trajectory downward after it went public, did nothing but mm. fall off, as you would say, fall off a cliff. But interesting, I've been noticing a, a trend where the CEO is out there. Like the, he just, they keep advertising the CEO. Have you noticed this the last six months? It's like, oh, he's Palantir's CEO's body fat is at 6% or something like, like just really bizarre Uh facts and yet the stock has gone from eight to 13 in a very short period of time right so it's interesting how different things get marketed in a space where um you know it's it, with the stock like that it's rolling the dice even though they're firmly entrenched in this next upward movement um with everything that's going on mm-hmm. volunteers in the in the driver's seat i think yeah in in I know we're not doing a review on that stock, but in ticker it's on sale and it's it what was really positive is they finally in their earnings report reported positive EPS. And that's a big transition point for stocks to because they're consistently negative. And that's why it was sitting there. You know, it kind of fell off a cliff back in 2020. And yeah. then all of a sudden we hit that positive earnings and beat analyst expectations. The revenue keeps increasing. I mean, the boxes are finally checking and we're moving in the right direction. I've I've been a long-term Palantir holder since the beginning. Um, so I'm like, finally, finally, yeah. <laughs> finally we're, we're getting on this rocket ship. So, but awesome. all right, let's transition to stock number three is a Lee Auto. Looks like they're based out of China. Is that correct? Yeah, Beijing, China. Absolutely. Beijing. Yeah. All right. Throwing a China stock at us. All right. Let's see what we got, Jaden. So we have a part of our software called Stock Rockets. And this is this is one of our coveted spaces where we highlight companies that have a have a large earnings quarterly revenue growth rate. So quarter over quarter um, has to garner a five-star North Star ranking in our system and be an industry top performer. So we throw all kinds of these high criteria at it. It's never a list of 10, 20 stocks. It's always a only a handful. And Lee happened to make this list today. Uh, the stock is up four point, let's see, 4.15 percent in the auto manufacturing space, $29.34 below average risk. It's part of our most watched in our community and, as I mentioned, industry best. So let's look at the chart and get it here. Here we go. Um, so you can see the stock, it's had its troubles um, in terms of the stock price over the last year. 
Uh, 25, 46 started out, went as high to $40 a share last June. And it's kind of been on a downward trend, but it looks like it might have reversed course here when it hit there. That was the time to buy it. 1362 in October, if you're buying stocks in October and if you weren't too, too concerned about the market. Um, but then it keeps going up. And what I like about this, uh, technically speaking, it's ideal. You got the price above the short-term and long-term SMAs. Uh, you've got the MFI at 60 again in a sweet spot. So technically the stock looks um, attractive here at this price. The, the five-star uh, again is a buy now rating for us. So we would suggest buy it here. And um, I think the, it looks like the weakest part is the fundamental metrics. Uh, we only are following two here, analyst recommendations and then the short percentage share. So we don't know quite what the insiders are doing. It's tough sometimes to uh, find companies based in Beijing or China that uh, where we can find the insider activity. Revenue growth is actually significant, up 97%. Um, let me go to the description here. Uh, through its subsidiaries, designs, develops, manufactures, and sells new energy vehicles in the People Re People's Republic of China. Mm -hmm. Smart electric vehicles, you know, again, in a space that is going to continue to be relevant and more significant going forward. Founded in 2015. A lot of employees, look at that, Sean, 19,396 yeah. employees. So that's interesting. That's a lot. Um, a lot of employees, big, big company. Yep. Upgrades and downgrades. We're seeing uh, buy recommendations. Us, like you, we do not put a lot of energy toward this or a lot of uh, credence in it, although we do like to see what the analysts are saying. And yeah, what well, looks like an interesting company. Let me go back to their market cap. Just curious to see. Uh, 28.8 billion. Okay. okay. So you know, decent size, um, not not a mega cap stock by any means, but decent size. So what it, what does ticker say? Yeah, let's let's dive in. Okay, so within ticker, we can see this is a watch. It's got a score of 56 out of 100, which is decent. Anything over 50 is good, but the margin of safety is zero. Not a lot of upside potential there. Um, let's jump to the financials tab. You did point out the revenue growth is consistent. You can see that here year over year. So we went from uh, 27 billion. This is Chinese, looks like uh, Chinese yuan. Um, went from 27 billion up to 45. So that's impressive. The net income, this is the issue is we went from negative 321 million to negative 2 billion billion. So that's why that EPS or that margin of safety is 0% because we're seeing that that negative EPS, you know, EPS essentially being your net income divided by outstanding shares. So that that's an alarming factor for me. Um, let's jump to cash flow. We did see a nice jump in 2021 up to 8.3 billion. Now we're back down to 7.3. Cash flow statements Ooh. looking all right. Um, assets are increasing nicely. Uh, 61 billion up to 86. Now with this type of business, I would expect liabilities and debts to increase. The reason is you need manufacturing plants, you need more materials, plastics, metals, aluminums, all that kind of stuff. So you're racking up a lot of liabilities um, and debt in order to pay for those things. You gotta be leveraging banks. Um, so both of those liabilities and debts are increasing. Um, equity is increasing. We don't want to see that. It's kind of flat, but maybe a slight bump. So financials look okay. It's just, again, going back to that net income and EPS, that's the big red flag. Hmm. Analyst ratings. Analysts are all green. Interesting. That is interesting. Yeah. Um, share price, you know, is at 28 approximately, um, fair value we put at $25. So not a lot of upside there. Um, let's jump to the earnings calendar, see what we're looking at big. Look at this. We beat expectations in February by 150% and then beat expectations by 1400% in May. 
really, really impressive. But it's been kind of hit or miss a few quarters. It did miss. So it's not super consistent. Mm-hmm. Um, on So the first M, I just want to do a real uh, high level uh, 4M here. Um, margin of safety, the first M looks all right. I, I You know, watch is kind of that gray area in between. Um, maybe if you really like EVs, it might be your goat. You could say, hey, this maybe checks the box. I probably wouldn't. And I'll get to that uh, reason why in a second. The meaning we know that EVs around the world, that's that's the future. And 3%, I think if it's not the US, it's the world, use EVs. That shows we have a huge... Uh, number of vehicles that need to be sold so anybody like tesla and ford and gm and toyota volkswagen my wife drives the id4 great vehicle um you know that it's like this is the way the world's going so we can probably thrive there the issue i have with and i told people that use ticker because they see tesla and tesla's pretty well rated consistently in fact let's just take a quick jump back to ticker and we'll go to uh Tesla. So Tesla's on sale, 83 out of 155% margin of safety. So much stronger business. Mm -hmm. Um, The challenge is getting to that place where you have the supply chain in order. You've got the manufacturing plants. You've got all those things in place. Um, that's hard to get to. And can Lee get to that scalability to manufacture enough vehicles to keep up with the Fords and the Teslas and the GMs and the Volkswagens of the world? Maybe, maybe not. Not so sure. And then management, I don't know who the CEO is. But I will say this, I tend to avoid China stocks. Um, nothing against the country, but um, we have known that there's been situations where companies are cooking the books. And yeah. those those reports aren't as regulated as we we have the rigor here in the states and with in Canada where you're located, you know they've gotten away with reporting and then things catch up and then shareholders you know are stuck with a short end of the stick later on. So for so for me that's that would be a, a no. I probably wouldn't invest in this stock, but I think it'd be fun to keep on your watch list, see how it performs next to other stocks. But I'm looking at. Me personally, I look at Tesla. Toyota is supposed to have like, I think, 25 EVs coming out in 2025 or something like that. Um, Mm -hmm. I'm a forerunner guy and they're going Mm -hmm. to the hybrid, which has got significantly more horsepower. I'm excited to see what they do there. And, And it's just like, there's so many different EVs coming out there. It's like, I would be... I would probably run with Tesla. (laughs) Yeah, and you know, it's it's a really good point that you brought up because we know there's going to be an influx of EVs in the market, and we know we have to participate in that somehow as an investor. So maybe it's actually looking at the company that we saw previously that takes part in the infrastructure of it, right? And then the support of it, um, the charging stations, that kind of thing. So always looking at like companies on the periphery of an industry can be really profitable as well. That uh, we'll wrap up here shortly, but there's a quick story I always like to share. In the 1850s in the United States, we had the gold rush and the people who made money during the gold rush were not the people mining gold, it was the people selling tools to the gold miner. So your pickaxes, shovels, and jeans, Levi's jeans was founded for that purpose. It's like you create the tool, which Scholes is that, that's the example. That's the tool that supports the trend. So yeah, of the two, if I were to pick one, definitely Scholes over Lee Auto. Same with us, exactly. (laughs) Well, cool. This was a lot of fun, Jaden, kind of going over three different stocks. We'll definitely have to have you back. We'll pick another three. But to the listeners or watchers out there, if there's any out here you have questions on, please, you know, you can email, you know, support at ticker.com. We can discuss more. But uh, you got a few stocks you can definitely throw on your watch list. Thanks, Sean. That was fun. All right. We'll talk to you soon, Jaden. See ya. See ya.